Good afternoon. It's a very exciting session um, for me. Um, I'm, I consider myself as an entrepreneur, even if I'm a social entrepreneur working for the public mm. good. But to have at my side uh, someone who is considered as one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our times, Sergey Brin, who is, as you know, the co-founder and president of Alphabet, I think it's a unique opportunity to exchange some views with you. And I wonder whether I should take my tie off or not. <laughs> uh, but um, but let, me, let me go immediately into the subject. Um, we talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, I have written a book uh, one year ago. When I look at the contents, I have the feeling uh, such a lot is already outdated. Um, what was uh, considered a year ago science fiction is already reality. So maybe my first question to you is, where do you see the edges and uh, the next frontiers of the fourth industrial revolution? Um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, tell all of you that you maybe should doubt my answers a little bit. Uh, so when I was heading up Google X a few years back. And one little project we had in there, uh, which is now called Google Brain, which was this AI effort. But I didn't pay attention to it at all, to be perfectly honest. And uh, you know, myself, having been trained as a computer scientist in the 90s, everybody knew AI didn't work. It's not like you know people tried it. They tried neural nets. None of them worked out. And uh, this fellow uh, who was, uh, you know, one of our top computer scientists, Jeff Dean, would periodically come up with me and, look, the computer made a picture of a cat. And uh, I'd say, OK, that's very nice, Jeff. Go you know, do your thing, whatever. Um, and fast forward a few years, uh, and now Brain probably touches every single one of our main projects, ranging you know, from search to photos to ads to uh, everything we do. And uh, uh, yeah, this uh, kind of revolution in deep nets has been very profound and definitely surprised me, even though I was like right in there sitting, like I could throw, you know, paper clips at him. Um, it's an incredible time. And, uh, and it's very hard to forecast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what can these things do? Uh, we don't really know the limits. And in 100 years, if we imagine ourselves, that, you know, that these can do kind of everything we can imagine and more. Um, uh, it's, um, it's a hard thing to think through and has really incredible possibilities. Uh, but it's, I think it's impossible to forecast accurately. But Sergey, would you, would you see more the positive side? Of course, as an entrepreneur, you have to see the positive side. But do you see also possible risks in all those? Um, uh, fancy, if I may use this word, a uh, word, a new uh, means which we will have at our disposal. I think it definitely requires some thought, uh, and um, and incredibly, and I'm here at, at Davos, and I'm just shocked at how I feel like the luddite in the room. You know, everybody's talking about well, how do we cope with this increased automation here and the jobs displaced and so forth, and um, you know, I feel like the one like, oh, you know, actually that's pretty hard to do with a computer, and I kind of know what we're trying to accomplish to make that technology work. And uh, I think a lot of folks here are, I think, correctly forward thinking, taking some of those innovations uh, for granted, and then saying, well, what does that mean for society and so forth? Uh, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, I think thinking through um, sort of AI is the continuing of the automation that we've seen in the past 200 years uh, and how that evolves society and economy and social order, uh, is that's the smart thing to do. I don't think it's sort of impossible somehow, yeah. but it deserves a lot of thought. You cannot, uh, let's say, stop it. You can channel it. and uh, But I, I want to follow up a little bit about the horizons. Um, we, we speak about our times now being, let's say, um, 
shaped by the digital revolution. Some people would say, when we sit here again, you came over 10 years ago as one of our young global leaders for the first time here. When we sit again together in 10 years, we may much more talk about the biological revolution. And of course, then there's a combination of the biological and the um, uh, digital revolution. Can you explain your thinking? Can you explain us your thinking in this respect, particularly because I know you are very interested in the medical issues also? Yeah. Uh, well, I, th I think you can approach health uh, from several levels and say, well, what are you know the specific things that we are afflicted with, whether it's uh, you know heart health or cancer, or, you know Parkinson's. I'm personally passionate about. Um, and you know, look at the specifics of treatments and understanding of those diseases. You can look at the more, and the, the, this is the dilemma I have. You know, as I kind of invest in Parkinson's research, should I be doing that, or should I be investing in more fundamental research? You know, you've seen what CRISPR, for example, yeah, yeah. has allowed you know biologists across all disease categories to use that kind of a tool. Uh, and it's just a more general kind of biochemistry innovation. Uh, and genomics has obviously brought yeah. us a lot of in, in innovation there broadly. Um, but then you could also ask the next question now, leading to, to what you said about the digital revolution. Well, if we had smarter processing, smarter software, you know, could it unveil you know, patterns and understanding you know, should we just be working on sort of the machine learning solutions that, that are broadly uh, going to allow us to do more in biology, but also in other fields, in economy and electronics and astronomy? Uh, so, you know, it's a whole set of layers, and these lower level layers, uh, the increased machine learning and so forth, kind of spans the gamut of human endeavors. And therefore, when you invest in those things, you get this multiplied effect. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you still need to do the biology. And then you need to understand the individual diseases. And ultimately, yeah. you need to treat individual people. So big data, uh, digital tools at the service of uh, medical and biological progress and advancing very fast. But can you imagine that in 10 years when we are sitting here, we have an implant in our uh, brains? And um, I can immediately feel, because you all will have implants, I can, and we measure your, your brain waves, and I can immediately tell you how the people react, or I can feel uh, how the people react um, to your answers. Uh, is it imaginable? Um, I, I think that is imaginable. I think um, I, I think you know you can imagine that. You can imagine well, you're going to be sort of transplanted into you know the the internet, Ritual. so to speak, to live forever in a digital realm. Uh, you know, you can imagine that you know you just in your biological incarnation are going to live to be some you know very long age. Uh, I think. It is almost impossible to predict. And in fact, um, the evolution of technology might be inherently chaotic. I mean, it could have been the case a couple hundred years back if it so happened that you know, electricity evolved a little bit mm -hmm. faster compared to internal mm -hmm. combustion, that we all would have been driving electric cars today, and then somebody would have a newfangled internal combustion thing that would be like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Um, but history happened to go one way. Uh, maybe there are fundamental inherent reasons for that. Uh, but I think when you, you know, ask these kinds of questions about the future, what does it mean to be human in the future? Um, what, what does it mean to be an individual versus society? Kind of where are we going in the long term? I mean, these are deep and powerful and fundamental philosophical questions. Yeah. But I don't know that we are equipped to answer them. I think it's premature because yeah. we don't know yet how the technology will uh, look like. Uh, but one, one fear which I have heard is that technology now is, and uh, digital technologies mainly have 
an analytical power. Now we go into a predictive power, and we have seen the first examples, and your company very much involved into it. But then the next step could be in, to go into a prescriptive uh, mode, which means um, uh, you, you do not even have to have elections anymore because you can already uh, predict what, uh, predict, and afterwards you can say, why do we need elections? Because we know what the result will be. Can you imagine such a world? Um, well, you might then further ask, well, why do we need to have you know, elected leaders at all? Yeah, because yeah, you yeah. might as well have all the decisions made. Yeah. Um, mm. I think that's, once again, I mean, you're venturing into, I think, profound questions. Um, you know, you can ask also, what will we actually want? I mean, we have a set of values and desires today um, that are probably pretty different than, um, you know, uh, before the Industrial Revolution and different still than before the Agrarian Revolution. Um, and we might continue to evolve. And, um, you know, many of us today participate, obviously, all of us probably, in the global economy developing and so forth. Uh, you know, some of us choose to be, you know, Buddhist monks and we yeah. just seek enlightenment through our spirituality. So, I mean, I think people have different ways of evolving and finding meaning in different situations. And it could be that the way we look at it 100 years from now is so different than we look at it today that it's almost unrecognizable for us, the, the thinking, the rationale, and the desires. Uh, we wouldn't even be able to translate. I think this is a, a very, um, uh, not only interesting, it's a crucial issue. Um, we, we are looking at technology very often threatening our present thinking, uh, interpretation of how uh, the world evolves. And actually, we probably we need new, you use the word meaning, we need new concepts to define what humanity is and what the purpose of our lives is. And we may go much more again into the direction of People are afraid of robotization, but it may be humanization, which robotization will allow. Would you, this is a very optimistic, uh, uh, let's say, perception, which personally I share, but would you, uh, w would you agree? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I think um, if you were to go back in time 10,000 years and yeah. you meet somebody out there, you know, work in their field, you would say, and they said, well, you know, where are you from? They probably wouldn't even ask you, what do you do? That wouldn't mm -hmm. be a meaningful question. Uh, but if you were to say, well, I'm an economist, they'll be like, I <laughs> what is it? plow my field, <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, we could talk more about, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that you mean you do. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it is exactly true. I think that if some of the burdens of day-to-day -day life uh, that have been increasingly alleviated uh, through technology, uh, through agriculture, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, you know, maybe that leaves us free to really think a little bit more deeply about who it is we are and what it is we seek. But those new technology paradigms need also, I would say, a new government governance paradigm. If I think of the old fashion, let's say, um, governments see a technological development or regulatory agencies, so there's a parliamentary commission, finally regulations come out after five years. This is absolutely not uh, suited anymore to our new technology. So we need, we need much more agile interaction between business, um, uh, regulators, civil society, and so on. Yeah, I mean, um, and once again, you know, I've been really blown away this year. As you know, I haven't been to the forum yeah. for about eight years. Um, and um, I think of the level of, uh, you know, enlightenment and conversation between, you know, uh, politicians and business leaders and social entrepreneurs uh, is incredible to me. And that's the kind of interaction I think that'll breed mm -hmm. success. And uh, I, I think also, oh, don't forget, in, you know, outside of here, you know, oftentimes it's a very antagonistic relationship mm -hmm. between government yeah, and business yeah. and so forth. And I think that also is very unhealthy. 
so I think not only you know, should we try to tackle things more quickly, but also in, in a real collaborative way. I think some of this, um, let's say, antagonistic view comes because people see particularly the effect on job elimination. And of course, you know, Schumpeter's rule of uh, creative destruction or destructive creation. Um, and people have um, difficulties to see the jobs of the future. I explain you will have maybe um, uh, we, we are in need of, uh, I don't know, robot polishers or uh, drone dispatchers. Uh, but I think there are limited possibilities for such skills. Um, where do you see the skills which you, I mean, I think you, in, in Alphabet, uh, you do not have um, enough people. I mean, you are permanently looking for people. But where, where are those jobs coming from and what skills do you particularly emphasize? I think, look, that is a fantastic question. And I think, you know, in the sessions I've attended, you know, everybody's asking that question. Uh, I guess I would hope that as some of the, you know, maybe more mundane tasks are alleviated uh, through technology, that people find more and more creative and meaningful uh, ways to spend their time. I think, you know, the way you're sort of, the word job specifically, you know, has a lot of implication and a lot of, you know, the way that we might have spent the past couple of generations, like a job means you go to the office like here and you do some things, you have some papers, you have an inbox, you have an outbox. Um, and, and I think so our mindset uh, is somewhat narrow in that way. And yet we have, you know, jobs that are more creative and thoughtful, you know, take economists, for example, uh, which is, you know, a hard thing to describe to, to, yeah. to a farmer. Fortunately, I'm an ago. engineer. So. Yeah, oh, you're an engineer, sorry. <laughs> okay, we have some economists here. It is the World Economic Forum. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think. Not engineering for me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, engineering is pretty easy to describe, I think, to folks. Yeah. Uh, but being an economist is not like that easy to describe. And uh, it's not that we need 5 billion economists. But, um, but the point is that uh, I think if you sort of continue that trajectory, uh, you do see more and more people that have been freed up over the past couple hundred years to do work that is you know, more kind of thinking about things or creating things, uh, you know, seeking aesthetics, uh, whether it is in an intellectual domain or a purely artistic domain. Uh, and I would hope to see that trend continue. Uh, and I would hope that the world would find you know, an opportunity. Uh, this is where I think education becomes very important. Um, and, and I think broad education. Yeah. But as you know, some of these jobs are displaced, giving people the opportunity to get educated from the point of view of having actually the education resources, uh, the uh, financial wherewithal to be able to pursue mm -hmm. that. Like, you know, you don't want to be you know, studying Shakespeare and going hungry or mm -hmm. something like that. And, uh, and being somewhat open-minded, giving people a chance mm -hmm. to develop different skills that aren't necessarily, you know, okay, we have 5,000 needs for this exact oh, kind of sure. thing today. Uh, because probably the thing that you want exactly 5,000 of today is the thing that also is more realistically automatable. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's important for people to be able to have freedom to study, financial opportunity to yeah. study, uh, and, and to get meaning. I think in addition to you know, work being an important way that you know, we exchange money and whatnot, uh, people find profound meaning in their day-to-day -day jobs, and I think that's another important yeah. thing for us to preserve. Okay. I, I would say this is the key, let's say, message for me, or the hope, that we can move from jobs which are meaningless much more to meaningful tasks. And say so maybe in the social area, in the cultural area, um, and that will be the underlying uh, 
concept for a more humanized uh, mm -hmm. society. But uh, I also agree with you, we need, um, uh, we, we, we shouldn't look at individual jobs now, where do we need 5,000 jobs more and so on. The key is the reformation uh, of the whole educational system, which is completely outdated. Would you agree? I think there are several systems that we have in place that I think for a lot of understandable reasons, you know, they just have so much inertia they lag behind. Education is one, yeah. and healthcare honestly is another, and I don't mean healthcare in the sense of finding the biological roots of disease. I mean, you know, sort of the healthcare systems mm -hmm. of hospitals and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe insurance, mm -hmm. be it national or employer or whatnot. Uh, and, uh, you know, these systems are just so deeply embedded uh, from an infrastructure point of view, from a sort of governance point of view, and so forth, they're very hard to transform and to update to today's needs. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that is a challenge that we should uh, seek to overcome. And within education, I mean, I just think everyone should have access to education. Starting, and I'm talking about, obviously, sort of primary education and uh, secondary and university, and you know, for that matter, uh, postgraduate work. Um, I mean, those things don't really, those things are extraordinarily expensive today for kind of artifacts of the infrastructure. We assume we need like big buildings and you know fancy classrooms and things like that. And I, I don't think those things are necessary. I mean, it's fine to have those for some folks, but uh, education should be universally accessible. Yeah. When I look at, uh, I mean, it's incredible the success of your company. And when I look at Silicon Valley in general, the success is mainly related also to a platform approach, and it's a new uh, management concept. Um, and of course, many people in envy you because uh, you are in this area where you have this exponential growth potential. Um, and this creates also some, not only envy, uh, also some, uh, uh, how shall I say, it's more than, uh, um, envy, it's, it's um, aversion against the Silicon Valley model um, because you can grow so fast. What would be your response? Um, I think, look, I, I think first of all, I'm very lucky to have been in yeah. uh, Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley is very lucky to have been able to benefit from you know the semiconductor boom and then software and now internet and mobile. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, there's a huge amount of luck there. Uh, but the luck also comes from taking many shots, uh, you know, so many failures. You know, if I told you all the dumb things that I did, um, you know, we'd have to have a much longer session. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the successes, you know, they often are chance, I mean, I mentioned the Google brain work that I, they were just off in the corner. It's like, okay, fine, just, you know, do your thing. Mm -hmm. uh, our, um, you know, Ver Verily, which is uh, our subsidiary that does a wide range of healthcare innovation now, uh, really started with this glucose sensing contact lens project. Um, and that was another one where I said, uh, this fellow Babak and Brian Otis who were working on it, uh, you know, and they wanted to put a computer in a contact lens. And I was like, you know what, that sounds crazy, but you know, you go do your crazy thing. You know, you can only have a couple people work on it. I'm not gonna give you a lot of resources. Uh, but uh, you know, sure, if you put a computer in contact lens, good for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet here they are, uh, you know, a few years later, and they're you know running, uh, you know, they're doing serious studies now. They have a big partnership with Novartis and Alcon. Uh, and they are, um, you know, hopefully going to bring those to market, alongside with a bunch of other projects that that has spawned. Um, and I didn't know anything about that, and I never would have predicted or guessed that. Um, I think we're just lucky to have the environment that tolerates, you know, making lots of risky bets yeah. and tolerating the failures that inevitably result. And it needs courage. I mean, uh, I could ask you the question I'm very often asked. Um, um, starting the forum with two people, some journalists ask me, media people ask me, did you ever imagine what is coming out? 
could you ever imagine what, what came out of your um, original entrepreneurial first <laughs> steps? Uh, no, I, I could not possibly have imagined. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I, I don't know what your thinking was behind the forum, but I remember when I was really thinking deeply about this, and this was sort of a, you know, a graduate student project at Stanford, and I, you know, I talked to my advisor. I was like, you know, should I really do this entrepreneurial thing? And, you know, it might not work out, and I can just finish my PhD. And, um, and he said, you know, why not? Go for it. And then if it doesn't work out, you come back, you finish your PhD, which I'm still planning on doing. But anyway, uh, <laughs> You know, there's like no big deal. Just give it a shot, and and I think that that mentality permeates uh, Silicon Valley, and I think that's one of the strengths uh, that you know there's really not much. It's not viewed so negatively to try something even if it doesn't work out. No. When you look back now uh, to this history, um, and you have a. I would say many young people listening to you here or via uh, digital transmission. Um, what would you, out of uh, your own experience, give us an advice to those young people? Who everybody sees you as a role model and wants to imitate you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you tell them as a key learning of your own? Um, um. You know, I, I think young people, uh, you know, in some ways, their their life is much easier than you know, sort of my life might have been at that stage. Just you know, for I think all of us, uh, you know, having before whatever, if we were traveling to Switzerland, it'd be a big stressful thing. How do you get in touch with people before mobile phones? Arrange your travel. Figure out how to exchange your currency. You know, there there are many things. You know, we can whip our phones out and look up anything and figure out how to get somewhere. Um, there are a lot of affordances that are such conveniences today that make it easy. But there is also uh, a global stage that makes it hard, actually. Uh, you know, because if uh, when I was in school and I was on the math team or whatever, I was just compared to other kids in the school. And I did quite well against them, you know, and I found myself, yeah, I'm good at that, I'm good at that. Uh, I think I find younger folks today are, their measures of themselves are always, especially you know, the ambitious ones, are on this global stage. They said like, well, you know, I have to be you know, number one in the world at this or that. And I'm like, you know, that's a really tall order. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think it can be discouraging in a way because yeah. if, uh, you know, you know, those folks say, well, you know, I'm number 1,000 in the world at this game, which, which, you know, in my world would have been an enormous achievement because that means, like, you were definitely the best in, like, your city and your state and whatnot. But, um, but it's, it's hard, and, and I think, you know, they get, there's a little bit of discouragement. So, uh, you know, I would encourage young folks to, you know, take chances and pursue their dreams and... Uh, you know, try to silence out kind of the voices that say, well, actually, there are like a thousand startups trying to do whatever, self-riding bicycles or whatever it is they happen to be doing. And I think the key is to have fun in your startup and not yeah. from the beginning on to think of the IPO, which may bring you a billion um, sets keep. And that was certainly not your motivation to make it a success. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly had no dreams of passion. such economic yeah. success. And uh, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think you should have uh, fun and not be so weighed down by the weight of expectations um, that I think sort of this global network, unfortunately, one of the downsides, I think it creates that weight. We are coming to an end of this fascinating mm -hmm. discussion. But my, my last question would be, um, I, I came from a luncheon and uh, we had a discussion. And we said, or well, the conclusion was, uh, we can address the issues which we have to confront in the world, not just in a rational way. The world in some way has to digest this tremendous uh, speed of change, complexity of change, which creates an emotional turmoil. So we have to respond much more also with values and not just with rational answers. And, what, what would be your values? Um, what, what are your driving values, Sergio? 
Uh, well, I, I, first of all, I, yeah, I think that's a very good question, an amazing question. And uh, not having been in Davos in eight years or so, I'm like kind of even confused in a good way. Uh, you know, because the, all these you know business executives and CEOs and everybody, everybody's wondering, well, how are you know how are people going to find purpose? And what about all these you know refugees? What about income inequality? I kind of feel like I'm at Burning Man, but <laughs> uh, almost, except we're all wearing clothes. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. So I think. Uh, for whatever weird reason, maybe it's because we're kind of San Francisco hippies, but uh, you know, Google has always had this a little bit of that uh, kind of social responsibility yeah. view. Uh, also inspired, by the way, by Salesforce, Mark Benioff, and his um, philanthropic work as part of the company. Uh, I, I, I think you're phrasing it exactly correctly. I think it can't be the case that companies uh, such as ours are just purely profit motivated. Uh, you know, sort of, you can't just take, you know, Adam Smith. Um, well, apparently I've learned here that Adam Smith's earlier work was actually much more touchy-feely than the Wolf of Nations. But, um, but you can't just, you know, think about narrowly, oh, this is your business. You know, you're just going to maximize earnings. It doesn't matter what else is going on around you. Uh, and I think the leaders here, from what I can tell, are broadly, broadly concerned about, be it climate change or yeah. wealth inequality or, uh, you know, this issue of job creation, uh, all of those things. And uh, so it seems to me that companies are taking those things seriously, and we ought to, we ought to be. And... Uh, Maybe there's some greater way to, uh, to you know, write about that, to imbibe that, and kind of the principles of company formation, uh, because I don't think sort of you know if you look at the laws and the regulations and you know SEC uh, kind of rules, technically you're meant to be purely profit seeking, and that's not really a reasonable position to take. Sergey, so, yeah, it's it's a great um, opportunity to to. Unfortunate opportunity because I would like to have much more time uh, to conclude this session. And um, what you just said is uh, particularly with, let's say, some Silicon Valley uh, companies like yours, people see those companies having tremendous power. And um, um, I was uh, recently together with a prime minister of quite an important country who told me, sir, three or four powers left in the world. One is US, one is China, and one is Alphabet. Uh, so oh. you, have, you, <laughs> ha you have this, uh, let's say, image of a very powerful organization. And I think this session was very important because it showed us that behind those organizations are people who are not detached from the world. People who ask themselves still questions. They do not now necessarily make everything possible to, to reign over the world, no. Those are people who have questions, who have doubts, who, uh, in, in your case, I may say so, who are modest. So I think um, this session was very important. And I thank you for um, um, sparing and no, sharing with us uh, not only your ideas, but your personality. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.